uh, for since we don't have a full house tonight, if you're aware of someone that did not get this information, please feel free to share with them um, so that they know where this thing, the funeral is going to be happening. Okay, 1 Corinthians, and I'm not there yet. Chapter 1. Uh, my approach on this is going to be in waves. I'm going to be sharing with you in waves. <clears throat> the first wave will be tonight <clears throat> and could possibly end, you know, tonight. And that is that we're going to just sort of go through the first, second, and third chapter. And in going through it, I'm going to um, elicit your comments on these scriptures. And we're going to discuss it a little bit. So please feel free to um, jump in. Uh, the second time around, whenever that is, <clears throat> I'm going to go through it with a little more emphasis and a little more, uh, well, it'll be basically me teaching, but not really the full brunt of what I feel like the Lord has for us in, the, in this. I'm just talking right now about the first three chapters. <clears throat> And then I'll go through one more time where I will really, really emphasize some of the things that the Lord has given me for this book. The reason why I'm going to do it this way is, one, I really want us to get this so that we are prepared for the rest of the book after that. Because these first three chapters really, really set up the, <clears throat> the things that he's going to talk about. And... And if we don't really comprehend what he's saying in the beginning, we may miss some of the things that are going to be coming up uh, later. So um, let's, let's just read the first chapter starting in verse 18, and that's where we're going to start in this. <clears throat> um, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Gentiles foolishness. But unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. <clears throat> All right, so I want to start by just uh, asking some questions and trying to get a basis uh, from, from each of us here of what these scriptures are really emphasizing and what is it talking about. And of course, verse 18, most of us should be well familiar with verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. 
Um, so my first question is, what is it that is so foolish to them that perish? What is it about this that is so foolish? Why would they consider this so foolish? Anybody? I'll read it again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. What about it would make them to consider this foolishness? That's honestly, <laughs> that's a really good answer. <laughs> Did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, it seems obvious and the right course of action in order to gain what they want. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the scripture, it doesn't seem like that's the case. Excellent. Excellent. Somebody else? Yeah. Well, it's weakness. I mean, you know, they're, they're looking for strength as saved to salvation and, and everything. And, you know, to the it contrast there, the strength, the strong, or the wise, or whatever, but God uses the foolish things, the, the weak, and not things that are not. Criminal. I mean, he died uh, criminals, a horrible criminal death. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Good. We can't do it. We can't do it. <laughs> and there is that element. It, yeah, there is that element in this also. Yeah. Kelly, did you have a comment? Okay. Anybody else? Ben, what do you think? <clears throat> okay. You know, yeah, Carolyn, do you have something? Well, I was just thinking to the world, um, it, the key is survival, and they're in bed. And they're constantly trying to survive and do anything they can to survive. Um, Amen. To, uh, if you didn't catch that, because she's kind of far from the microphone. Carolyn Allen was just saying to survive, you know, the last thing they're looking for is death, right? To survive, you don't go that direction. Um, you know, I feel really stupid teaching this class now because you guys had some great answers. I mean, those were really, really good. I don't know if everyone comprehends how good those responses were. But they really are um, in tune, in tune with what Paul's trying to say, which is a big deal, folks. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that can quote scripture, but to be in tune with the author or the person that's speaking, that means that you've, yeah, you know, it almost means you've spent some time with them. You've spent some time in the Word, you've spent some time. Uh, going beyond just the normal thing. Um, honestly, and I wouldn't have been upset at all about this, but honestly, what I expected to hear from some was something like this. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but to we who are saved, it is the power of God. I expected to hear something like this. Um, they think the, the, the way of Jesus is foolish and, that, you know, but we know that it's um, the power of God because by that cross, we all got saved. And not a one of you actually mentioned salvation in the, in the traditional sense of the thing, you know. You didn't go there. You, every one of you actually address this from the standpoint of not what religion says that scripture says, but the context of that chapter. 
the context of that chapter and the direction that Paul, when he started with that pen and started releasing that ink on that paper, he had a direction that he wanted to bring this to. And frankly, that was just great. I, I'm, I'm encouraged. <laughs> um, and uh, my little response that I put down there, what is so foolish to them that perish that God would choose to be crucified to save the world? That God would choose that, the crucifixion as the way, you know. My Lord, I mean, it's God. And remember, to the Greeks particularly, this is foolish. Why? Why? Why would this be particularly foolish to the Greeks? They do. That's exactly right. And what? And wisdom based on what, Carolyn? That's it. No, they they. Very. Yeah, it's totally opposite. Um, the gods were very petty and very selfish. Uh, but, you know, you call it the mythology, the Greek mythology, but I don't think they called it mythology back then. They believed in these gods. You know what I mean? I mean, they thought that these gods were really true and everything. And so, as Carolyn was saying, to think that God would choose crucifixion for himself is outrageous and and um, I, I was reading one of the guys who commented on this and he said the word foolish there does not um, really translate over the the appall appallingness of uh, being appalled uh, at this method that God chose um, all right next let's see let me make sure here okay now we've sort of answered this but I just want to see I just want to see if there are any other answers. How is the cross seen to be the power of God? We actually didn't answer that. We gave nominal Christianity's example of that. How is the cross seen to be the power of God? Somebody? Uh -huh. Yes, that's good. I think, you know, it's Christ himself is being, through the cross, Christ becomes the power of God to us, they believe. Amen. And um, uh, ultimately, he ends with that because he says that he chooses the base and the foolish and this and that, but Christ is made unto us those things so that he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. So clearly what you just said is the direction he's headed. He wants, as part of the, as part of the uh, uh, picture that he's trying to pay place here in front of us. Uh, anybody else? Because there is more, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know how good these microphones are picking up, but she said by it, he's able to accomplish everything that he wanted to accomplish. Okay, there's, there's still, Kelly, do you have a comment? Well, is that what it is doing this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, to me, I mean, one angle I personally like is that it's like the dynamite of God to blow up the old creation and destroy it forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. And Carol touched on it earlier, but he's the only one who can do it. Yeah. He's the only one who can do it, and that's why we need Jesus. I think that sort of lends itself to what Mike was saying, too. Yeah. Jim? In that wording, though, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's through the cross, through the death to us, that this power of God is able to. Okay, I think that's, I think what you're saying there is, lends itself also to what Jennifer was, was trying to point out. And just to use the words that I tend to use, and I actually got them from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 
but um, how is the cross seen to be the power of God? Life comes out of death. Life comes out of death. And that's God's way. And that's, that is mind-blowing to the wisdom of this world. And yes, it does, obviously it does ultimately crush the old creation. Yes, all of the, but the reality is that the power of this, this cross, the power of this death is that from it springs forth life. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Good, good comments again. Okay, verse 19. For, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Um, how would you characterize the wisdom of the wise? What does it entail? So when he's talking about here this, and we sort of hit on that, but there are a few other angles that we could come from. When you read this, and it says the wisdom of the wise, or the wisdom of this world, because it uses both phraseologies, actually, what is that referring to, specifically? Yeah. Okay, let me just say that in case everybody's not getting it. How we problem solve, how we deal with issues, how we overcome, really, how we get on top, both of those, you know. I mean, we're, as Christians, we like the word overcome. But what if, we, what if it got translated uh, how we get on top? Would it, would it affect your motivations in it anymore? But anyway, sorry, go ahead. Or change something. To change something, that's his wisdom, that's his way of working. Yeah, the cross is his wisdom. Not just his power, but his wisdom. Yeah, he destroys that. I'm going to come out on top. He completely negates it by taking it to himself and taking it all. Okay. Right. Any other comments on, on the, did you have something? Well, I was thinking about how the person who's lived all their life, the wise person who's gotten on top when they come to Christ, that all the wisdom that they had to get on top suddenly seems like nothing to them anymore because all the striving they did when they come to the Lord, they realize really it, it doesn't satisfy, it doesn't, it doesn't actually do anything eternal. So it really breaks that person down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and in a very real way, it is, having spent your life proceeding on a basis that is the exact opposite mm -hmm. of God. It is self-centered, self-motivated. You ever heard about that? I want to hire somebody who's self-motivated. Yeah. Anybody ever heard that kind of stuff, you know? You know, I'd rather be Christ-motivated. But folks, now, you know, just for a, a reality check here, there are a lot of churches that emphasize this very wisdom of the wise, this very wisdom of the world, that God came to bring a wisdom that will make you successful, that will make you prosper, that will make you, you know. And in most cases, it's by putting yourself first. It's not by giving up or laying down or losing. It's, it's, it's in fact, the whole point is, is to make somebody else lose, you know, to somebody else to give up, you know. So that's how the, the preachers can preach that because they're asking everybody else to die, to lay down, to give up so that they might gain, so that they can tell you, you can live this way too. Anybody see a problem with that? Okay, and I'm not trying to raise an army of, <laughs> and go. I'm just saying it is the exact opposite of what Paul is trying to communicate here. Um, and and this, these scriptures will bear that out more and more as we go here. All right, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Um, Com, uh, contrast and compare the two uses of the word foolish or foolishness in verse 18 and verse 20. 
verse 18 says, uh, they consider God's wisdom foolish or God's cross foolish. Verse 20 says, God hath made foolish the wisdom of this world. So basically, can you see what I'm looking for? Anybody have a comment on that? Verse 20 and verse 18, basically, and, and there are other places in these scriptures. I just grabbed one right there. They're basically showing that um, that men look at God's crucified wisdom. And they think that is so foolish. God looks at men's self-promotion and self-seeking and, and seeing how many people you can step on to get to the top as foolish. That's what I was looking for. God sees it as foolish, you know. Um, and one of the things, I'm sure you already know this, most of you are pretty well balanced in these things, but, you know, the goal would never be to, you know, go, let's put it like this, God, even though he sees it as foolishness, his goal is to save and to bring to himself each and every one of those people. But folks, there is no salvation without being made one with Christ. I hope you know that. And to be made one with Christ means you give up all that wisdom. There's where it's destroyed, by the cross and by oneness with Christ. Because it's not truly destroyed just by Jesus dying on the cross. Because there were, you know, there were uh, Herods and, and uh, Pontius Pilate's and Pharisees and high priests who continued long after that. And it didn't change anything in them. But you... Embrace Christ. You embrace the cross. You embrace oneness with Christ. You embrace becoming a different species. If any man be in Christ, he is a new species. That's one translation of it. Old things have passed away. Okay, well guess what, guess what some of those old things are? Proceeding in this way. The way, the way Mallory was talking about. Having this as your way of proceeding. That passes away. <coughs> if any man be in union with Christ, like a branch is to the vine, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become there. That's the scripture right after. <coughs> all right. All right, verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Um, let's go to verse 24. But unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Again, when comparing verse 18 with verse 24, what do we conclude? 18 and 24, both have the word power in it. And Mike, you, you actually said this earlier. You commented on that, and I, I appreciated it when you did. <clears throat> um, that... That, that in verse 18 is talking about the cross as the power of God. In verse 24, but unto them who are called, both Greeks and Jews, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And what you're getting there is what Paul calls and and he doesn't always specifically use this terminology so you have to be careful you have to know 
what he means at times when he just says Christ or he says the cross. Because he's talking about this full phrase that we're gonna, we'll see in chapter 2, verse 2, Christ crucified. The cross is the power of God in verse 18. Verse 24, Christ is the power of God. In both instances, it's one and the same. It's Christ and him crucified. That's the power of God. That's what he's trying to bring about. In fact, I think, oh, and then, all right, now let's read verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Gentiles foolishness. And that, that word but is in answer to the Jews require a sign, uh, meaning some sort of power or, or, you know, supernatural manifestation. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Um, Stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but unto them who are called, both Jews and Christ. Christ crucified that we preach in verse 23. Are you following it? Because he is going to ride this pony all the way through these chapters. He will not leave this theme he is setting the stage for specifics in the lives of the corinthians right now it sounds all doctrinal but it's not he is setting the stage for something bigger and greater in relationship to how they live all right verse 25 says because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What is the foolishness of God and the weakness of God? Weakness of God. Someone? What is the foolishness of God and what is the weakness of God? Christ crucified. I'm, I'm going to give a different answer because it's not, it's, it is Christ crucified. I'm going to give a different answer here in a minute just to help shine the light on a direction Paul is about to take. Anybody else? <laughs> well, uh, he chose to, to uh, bring salvation, like we were talking about earlier, through weakness, through giving, through, like you were saying, God chose to die. That's right. Uh, and that actually became the power of God because you couldn't, I mean, that was the lamb himself, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and his very nature, yeah. you know, that through that person, that the being that he is, the, the essence of him, you know, being made weak. Yeah. And... And one of our other passes, we're really going to get into that. But you're right. It's the lamb nature. It's, it's as Mallory said, Christ crucified, the self-giving one who's, who is these things. Yes. Amen. It is. It is. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give my answer to begin to prepare our thinking. Um, uh, what I said in, in verse, what is the foolishness of God and the weakness of God? It is the wisdom and it is the power of God. Okay. Paul says that. It, it says that right here in our Bibles. That the, when God was weak, the weakness of God, that's when the power of God came forth. And God was most foolish and humiliated and shamed, as, as Mike and Kelly were given descriptions there from the scriptures, that is the wisdom of God. 
Paul is going to show that this, is, this was God's plan. You know, some people say, well, why do you people at New Creation or Acts Bible School teach this kind of stuff? What? You know, da, da, da. We didn't come up with it. God came up with it. God decided that this is how he was going to come into the world. This was how he would introduce himself. He would be known forever by a cross and by a death. God himself would come down here and choose. Oh, come on. How many ways could the creative God think to save the world and to change things? I mean, couldn't he have come up with a better idea? And the answer is, not really because of his, his nature, because the, what he did is in accord with who he is, contrary to the way many of us are. And what I mean is, many times we do stuff that is not really who we are. You get in with a crowd of people. You ever hear of peer pressure? You get in with a crowd of people, and then you start acting like them, you know, and doing stuff. But God can't do that. He can't be different than he be. <laughs> Bad grammar. Good theology. Yes. That's good. And, and so, you know, he's, he's trying to show us who can't fathom and can't understand. Right. Uh, and it's kind of like the parables, you know, bring it down to us. Yeah. But, but you were saying that's his nature, so there is no weakness in his nature. There's right. no weakness. He's all strength. Yeah. He so, can't so Carolyn was just saying we can't understand when God says, you know, that, that there is, he, she said, there is no weakness in God. And everybody can hear her here, but they can't on there. So that's why I'm repeating. There is no weakness in God. And so what he's doing is not really weakness at all. It is power and it's not foolish at all. It is incredible wisdom. Okay. But we're of this earth. We're fallen creatures. We've made our way without God. We've learned that if you really want to get ahead, you just uh, you know, step on everybody else and you use people and you manipulate or you use uh, force or you know, pressure in some way. And that's how you accomplish for God. And this happens all the time in Christianity. For God. That's how, that's how you get the work of God done, you know. Uh, I remember when we were over on Maple Street and, you know, I would not initiate things that God wasn't initiating and people got upset majorly with me. Well, we need this program. We need that. We need to have this. And I said, you know, do you, are you, is the Lord on you to do that then? Well, no, just as, you know, the church needs to do that and you're the pastor. And I said, well, that is not what I'm getting from the Lord, you know. I would rather have everybody hate me and be with the Lord than to be with a bunch of, you know, those people turn on you in a second. Do you understand what I just said? They will turn on you in a second. You know, even you do what they say, they're going to expect you to do what they say the next time around. You can't, you know, that's where Christ has to be formed in us to such a degree that we're not moved. You know, we're solid on what is the Lord, and that's more than a theology in our heads. That has to be Christ, the power of God, Christ, the wisdom of God, Christ and him crucified, meaning that, that our lives are not just controlled, they're crucified. That cross crucified us and released a whole nother life has been, as, as has been shared here. Did I see another hand? I thought I saw one and don't want to, okay. I don't want to miss anybody here. All right, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. <clears throat> um, let's see. 
yeah, let's go ahead and read verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. All right, my question. What does God choose more than anything else when looking into the world? You can read it in verse 27, or you can kind of go like this and look heavenward and think God's going to... Did y'all hear what Mallory just said? But let's, let's be clear here. I don't believe he's talking about people. I believe he's talking about traits in people. And why do I say that? Because this is the trait that is God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, meaning me putting it on this base, and the weakness of God. And the very thing, when he turns from looking at Christ crucified and looks into the world, he says, if I'm going to choose something, if I'm going to pick something, I choose foolish. I choose weak. Isn't those the exact words verse 27 are saying? See, that's no coincidence. A lot of times we as Christians break off from verse 25 we finish that thought and we think a new thought is being brought up in verse 26 27 28 but he is continuing his thought pertaining to the wisdom of the world as opposed to the wisdom of men the wisdom that is the cross and you know let me make sure that that's clear I didn't say the wisdom of the cross, but the wisdom that is the cross. The wisdom that is Christ crucified. That wisdom. That wisdom. That total self-giving. That, um, see, I don't want to, uh, this is the early pass we're making here, so I don't want to go into it too much, because we'll make another pass through these same scriptures as we go. So, so I'll, I'll just end with that. So, um, verse, um, let's go to verse 30. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Um, verse 30, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Does God give this wisdom unto us? Somebody? Raise your hand. Kelly? Someone else? Mallory? Okay, well, I, I agree. Um, he doesn't give us this wisdom. He gives us Christ. But of God are you in Christ Jesus who is made unto us wisdom. There's no giving going on there. But you have to be in union with Christ. But of God are you in union with Christ, who then is made unto you. Okay, now, remember, we've never left our theme here. You gotta, you, that's the thing you've got to keep in mind. We have not left our theme. What is, what is he talking about in verse 30? He's still talking about wisdom, isn't he? Isn't he? Where did that come from? Where did that thought come from? It's not, see, we, we make that something different than the first, whatever, 25 uh, uh, scriptures up to this point. And we just say, now God is going to be this unto me somehow. Folks, the wisdom that he is talking about right here is the wisdom that is Christ crucified. Do you see it? That's the wisdom that Christ is to you. Because guess what? He can't give you that wisdom. If he gave it to you, you'd forget it or misuse it or, or something else because it has to be Christ in us. It has to come by union. It, it, it is, that wisdom is contrary to our selfish constitution. It is totally contrary to who we are, and we try as we will, and pray as we will, and fast as we will to be different. The difference is Christ, and the difference is Christ in us. And that's what this verse is trying to communicate to us, is, is that um, 
God can't give you this wisdom. He can't just, there is no way that he can do that. It must come through, get ready, Christ crucified, union with Christ crucified, because, let's follow it through, because union with Christ crucified first leads you to death at the cross, does it not? I mean, true union with Christ first, first leads you to the cross. And that's where you get the, the scriptures and the verses like out of Romans where it's, uh, or Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. That's where the, the concept of the cross uh, uh, that Paul had and that the early Christians had was so different than, than modern day Christianity because when they saw the cross, they understood that's why Paul said those words. I am crucified. What? I am crucified. How? Through union with Christ crucified. That's where it ends. But guess what? That's where it ends for our constitution, our old nature. But if any man be in union with Christ, there is a new creation. If any man be in union with the vine, there is new kind of fruit. Sense? Uh, Mallory. Yeah, that word which is made in us, mm -hmm. it can also be translated he becomes that. So it's like what he already is in himself. When we become a, when we come into relationship with him, what he is in himself, he becomes to us. Praise God. Uh, See that the change is just that we're going. That's the only change that happens. He's the same. I, I don't know if that mic's picking you up, but she said that the actual word there made unto us is he becomes that unto us. That's what it is in the Greek, and she's Got a Greek Bible sitting right there in her lap and a halo around her head. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Nisi, I, I knew there was another hand somewhere. Yeah, I was just thinking back to um, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and how um, the devil still, even though he was fallen, did not comprehend this, which is how come the, the cross was successful. It was still, he didn't get it then. That's right. And so then comes the, the, the failure and, and the fracture of mankind, you know, from God, because we do ultimately want this. We just now have been in the genealogy of the wrong tree. Yeah, absolutely. And so the core of our being truly wants that wisdom, but because we're born after that, we don't know the right tree to get that. Amen. As a human being. Amen. And it's foolish then. Nisi is, is uh, using the example of Adam and Eve and the tree, the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And, and, uh, and she just mentioned that he's, you know, she said, uh, the serpent said, well, this is, well, I guess they thought it, you know, she thought it. This is a tree to make one wise. Now, we're talking about the wisdom of this world and the wisdom that is Christ crucified. Um, I, I, before I s just say a few many, a few things on that, I want to make sure that we understand that the way God is approaching this in his word is there's only two kinds of wisdom. You know, I mean, there's only two kinds of people those who love Neil Diamond and those who hate him. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, 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 that can't be right. Um, <laughs> the only two kinds of wisdom, and that is, get ready, the wisdom of the Lord. Anybody ever prayed for the wisdom of the Lord? 
Do you have any clue? I mean, do, do you really understand what you're praying for? <laughs> of, course, of course not. Because that's this wisdom of Christ crucified, this crucified wisdom is exactly what is being demonstrated here and, and that Paul will prove by the way that he lives um, that this is the wisdom of God, not part of the wisdom of God or an aspect of the wisdom of God. That this is God's wisdom. And the other wisdom of the world, folks, isn't, isn't how to fix an 18-wheeler or how to grow, you know, uh, kumquats in an arid climate or something. I don't know, you know. It is, or great mysteries of the universe or, or physics or, it's not any of that. In God's mind, everything that they think in relationship to what they're doing is self-centered so that they might get ahead at the expense of other people, if necessary. Okay? See, lots of hands here. Yes. So that's why he couldn't give us wisdom, because then we would boast in it ourselves, because it would be something that we got. Yeah, we would boast in it. So he can't, that's right, he can't give it to us, because we would. He that... Glories, let him glory in the Lord. Absolutely. Um, did I? Yeah. Um, this goes with what Nisi was saying is that Satan couldn't understand either because he tried right. to rise about God, so he couldn't have any concept yeah. of what giving himself over. No, he, he doesn't. And, and you know, um, one of the things I was just going to add to what Nisi shared, which was really good, is is um, when, she, when she saw the tree that it was good to make one wise, she took. Folks, that's not the wisdom of God. Do you understand? You know, she took because she wanted to make herself wise. Okay. You come to Bible school to make yourself wise in the things of the Lord? No. You come to know the Lord. You come to have Christ formed in you. You come after another, not for your sake, but for his sake, for his glory, for his honor, that he might live. Paul said, I'm crucified that he might live. That is just the opposite of most Christians who when you ask them, what is the thing that you glory in the most? Remember we talked about this at two conferences ago. You know, what is the thing, you know, that you glory in the most? That the cross saved me so that I would live. Thank God he died. But Paul says, I glory in the cross by which I am crucified to the world. He's glorying in the cross of his own death, a cross of his own crucifixion. That's the wisdom of God. And, and the difference is, you know, now let's face it. Let's just face it. And I need to quit here because I think we're real close. But anyway, the, um, do you, can, you hear, can you hear us talking here and can you imagine somebody listening going, well, that's just foolish. Well, if you can, then you had not been flushed out totally. I'm joking. But, but, I mean, it is true that that, that thing rises within us that says, well, I don't want to die that Jesus will live. I want Jesus to die, so I'll live. Now, we would never say it in those words because that's too blatant and that shows us up for what we really are. But we would embrace a gospel that promotes the Son of God's death so that I don't go to hell. <laughs> Paul promoted a gospel of his own, that I am crucified. Christ lives within me. It's the promotion of someone else to your own loss. Foolishness to the Greeks. Stumbling block to the Jews. But to we who are called you see your calling, brethren. You see, doesn't it say that? Verse 26. This is what we're called to. And this is going to be Paul's theme for the Corinthians because he feels 
they have somehow gotten off the true track of God and they're now in danger of another gospel and another spirit. Okay? We need to stop. Um, all right, we'll just pick up right here when you get back. Take a break. <laughs>